Larry Sampler is assistant to the administrator, Office of the Afghanistan and Pakistan Affairs of the United States, Agency for International Development, also known as USAID, and he's going to be speaking on Afghanistan failure versus fact. So please welcome Larry Sampler. Thank you. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm pleased to be able to come to Boston and speak. Um, I think these kinds of fora are, are actually quite useful and, and they're enjoyable for me because there are such a variety of people who are present at these kinds of events. As a government bureaucrat, I spend a lot of my time talking to the same people day in and day out and many of us say the same things each time we speak. So it's, it's kind of a, a particular pleasure to be able to talk to a different audience with perhaps different perspectives. I have about 15 or 20 minutes worth of prepared remarks which I will blaze through. Um, and at the end, if there's time before you have to go to lunch, we'll do a little bit of question and answer. Um, before I start, just a couple of observations based on the panels that I've heard so far today. I think they were all very good, and I think for those of you who are perhaps not um, experienced in the Afghan theater or have not got a lot of exposure to what's going on in Afghanistan, the panels were all very, very useful. They reminded me, though, of a parable from uh, the continent of India about six blind wise men who were introduced to and asked to describe an elephant. And each of the blind wise men were introduced to a different part of the elephant. One grasped it by the trunk and said it's like a very thick, strong snake. Another by the tail who said it's like a willow. And of course, the leg or the ear, I, I won't belabor the parable. But each of the blind wise men, in his own way, was able to describe the elephant as completely as he could. All of them were correct, but none of them were absolutely or completely correct. Until another man was able to come forward and stop the squabbling and the fighting and say, you know, you're all describing different aspects of the same animal. And when you hear in the panels that you've already heard from and the panels this afternoon and from my presentation different perspectives, I think a lot of time what you're hearing is a manifestation of that particular parable. Afghanistan is, depending on who you ask, a 14-year engagement or 14 one-year engagements that the United States has participated in. The Afghan perspective is very different from that of the Pakistanis. The perspectives of the Pashtuns are different from that of the Tajiks and the Hazaras. Um, and the perspectives of a white boy from North Georgia are very different from those of almost everybody else. So I hope that my remarks will be of some interest to some of you. <clears throat> One other observation that I'll make. Afghanistan, depending on how you count their latest uh, uh, birth date, um, is about 12 years old. And when I speak on the Hill to members of Congress, I remind them that when the United States was 12 years old, um, we were putting down two insurrections in different parts of our country. Our Congress was thrown out. Our Constitution, the Articles of Confederation were scrapped. Largely, I might add, because we were unable to collect enough taxes to pay the bills that we owed the donors who had financed our Revolutionary War. Women were still about 100 years from having the right to vote in the United States. Slavery was still legal. And to the remarks on the earlier panel, wealth in the United States was still concentrated in the hands of the landowners and the extremely wealthy. So I'm constantly preaching a sort of strategic patience to members of Congress as we talk about the budgets and as we talk about the way ahead in Afghanistan. It doesn't mean that we can be or that we can allow complacency, but keeping in mind the perspective and the glacial pace of societal change, I think makes it a little bit easier and gives us, again, back to my six blind men, a different perspective on what we're experiencing in Afghanistan. So let me begin by thanking again the host <coughs> here, excuse me, at UMB for having me up, the previous panelists. As I do at every panel, I'd like to also recognize and thank the veterans from the US military and civilian agencies who have put so much of their time and, uh, and effort, and in fact, their blood in some cases, into um, securing Afghanistan. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's also important, I, I, I make it a point to recognize whenever I can, the tremendous value and expertise and knowledge of the Afghans who are both in the room and who are working even as we speak today in Afghanistan to secure their own country's future. <clears throat> I, I'm conscious of the fact that no matter how long I work on Afghanistan, and I'm coming up on my 12th or 13th year now, 
I will never know as much and I, as I think I do, and I will never have nearly the experience or the expertise to bring to bear as the Afghans, some of whom we heard on previous panels. So today I'm going to frame my conversation around perceptions versus reality, and through the dichotomy of perceptions of failure versus some of the realities on the ground, I hope I'll be able to address the, the title and the root interest of building sustainable communities in Afghanistan. So we frequently talk about risk versus reward, fraud versus innovation, waste versus need, corruption vice capacity. These are all phrases that we've heard or read on television or newspapers, journal articles. And if you only follow the mainstream media, it would be very easy to conclude that all we've received for the American blood and treasure invested in Afghanistan are small, very anecdotal successes, tainted by the specter of lost, <coughs> excuse me, taxpayer dollars. I'm appreciative of the fact that the panels today have by and large refuted that. A large part of what I do in my job as the assistant administrator at USAID for Afghanistan and Pakistan is um, respond to these allegations and try to separate truth from fiction and, and try to talk to members of Congress and the community of interest in Washington about the different perspectives that may explain a particular anomaly that they've identified. So how has the quality of life in Afghanistan changed over the past 13 or 14 years? And what has USAID done to help ensure that those changes are positive, sustainable, and available to ever increasing numbers of Afghans in their country? How has USAID performed as stewards of taxpayer dollars? How well have we adjusted to the changing environment and lessons we've learned in Afghanistan? And how well have we balanced between the need for measurable outputs, development outcomes, and impacts as returns on the very healthy and significant investment made in Afghanistan? All the while taking into account Senator Henry Clay's admonishment that statistics are no substitute for good judgment. <clears throat> Afghanistan's road to today has been hard, and while things have gotten better, and much better in many cases in Afghanistan, we must honestly acknowledge that the road ahead will continue to be challenging. The resilience, the passion, the pride, and the innovation that have brought Afghanistan thus far, enhanced by continued access to health care, education, and good and increasingly better governance, I think will ensure that they continue to make progress towards a better, brighter, and more prosperous future. And I welcome, when we get to the question part, questions about my prognosis for Afghanistan, because I, I am cautiously optimistic. But maybe one of the best ways for me to talk about both the past and the future of Afghanistan and USAID's role there is by addressing some of the most recent myths that have been found in the press. And so I'll do about three or four myths about Afghanistan. And, and this is a little bit lighthearted, but these are, these are actually serious things that have to be addressed. Most recently, there was a story in BuzzFeed that USAID can't find the schools, the students, or the teachers that we've invested U.S. tax dollars to build. I hear a lot of stories like this, and the headlines are often quite sensational. And I publicly once described these stories as being all sizzle and no steak. Once you read past the headline, there's just not a lot there that really can't be explained in fairly simple ways. We at USAID, and I particularly, am one of the first to admit that the education system in Afghanistan is not perfect. But again, if you think about the context, a national system of education that's been in existence for less than a decade in an active war zone is unlikely to be perfect anytime soon. But everyone from USAID, the entire international community, the, and the Afghan government, particularly President Ghani, recognize that education, as was noted by the panelists, is a prerequisite to Afghan sustainability. It is a prerequisite to Afghan sustainability. That's why we collectively are working to continue to improve it. Now, when we started working in Afghanistan in 2002, the country had been devastated. Um, I, I wish the, arch the uh, architect had been able to talk more about what you found in Kabul and what you found in Kandahar and the other cities of Afghanistan. When I went to those cities in 2002 as we prepared for the emergency Lloyd Jirga, it was devastated. <clears throat> there was no infrastructure. Excuse me. <clears throat> there were no opportunities for children to learn. There were no roads for children to walk on to get to school that were safe. The roads had been mined or the roads were covered by remnants of war from the Soviet period. There were certainly very few schoolhouses. Boys had, depending on where they lived and the status of their family, some opportunities for education. Girls had absolutely none. 
In order to jumpstart a virtually non-existent education system, USAID and the other donors built and refurbished a number of schools. <clears throat> but at that point in time, for a variety of reasons, any construction project was challenging. So most of the schools that we built, that the BuzzFeed article referred to our inability to find, were built over 10 years ago, many of them in areas that were and are still very insecure, <clears throat> many of them in areas where population migration may have rendered a particular school no longer relevant. Just like schools in the United States in any state or county here may close or may move or may merge, the same thing has happened over the past 10 years. The only difference is that those closures and those movements have probably been a bit accelerated by the continuing war. Building schools was part of an urgent humanitarian effort to make education immediately available to children who had no concept of what being in a school would be like. But I would suggest, as Paul and some of the others did, that we've now left the urgent phase of our operation behind us. <clears throat> we are now firmly focused on the future, and we're increasingly preoccupied with what the legacy will be for a booming young population of Afghans who are hungry for opportunities. We're no longer building schools. Instead, we're hoping and helping to build a ministry and an education system so that Afghans themselves can shape and deliver their education for their children. USAID in the field of education will continue to do what we know has worked, things such as teacher training. We will continue to train the thousands of teachers that end up in every province of the country, instructing the next generation of Afghans labor force. And we're not just training teachers, we're actually training teachers of teachers at these universities so that the, the quantity and the quality of Afghan teachers will continue to grow. One of our most successful strategies in Afghanistan stems directly from our experience building schools. In remote villages, the nearest actual school building may be several miles away over roads that are too dangerous for any child to traverse, particularly for girls who are not typically allowed to make long trips. So what we've done is we're focusing some of our resources on community education. These are classrooms that are installed in a local village building or perhaps even a home with a teacher who is able to provide primary education in situ in a particular village. Um, again, this was not something that we went into Afghanistan expecting to do, but as we adjusted to the circumstances that we found on the ground, it was something that we found to be very well received and reasonably successful. Primary and secondary education continue to be important, but it would be folly to prepare a generation of Afghans to build their future and that of their country without also considering further education. So USAID continues to provide additional education for the growing cohort of career-focused young adults by su supporting institutions of higher learning. Universities like Kabul University and the American University of Afghanistan provide specialized technical training <clears throat> needed for an ever-increasingly diverse job market and to fuel the economy that I think Jim was talking about. Again, I, one of the biggest changes I've seen in the 12 years I've been working on Afghanistan is the intellectual capacity that is coming not from abroad into Afghanistan, but that is being raised indigenously from the girls and boys who have attended Afghan school, schools from kindergarten now all the way through the 12th grade and are entering higher universities. <clears throat> AUAF, the American University of Afghanistan, is very proud to point out that their schools are teaching curricula that could be found anywhere in the world. <clears throat> so the second myth that, that we rely, we USAID or the donor community rely on um, uh, inaccurate numbers. <clears throat> Thank you, I, I'm having a little bit of trouble with just. <clears throat> in Afghanistan, numbers are kind of a broad measure that we use for how successful we've been. There's no question that in dealing with um, our colleagues in Congress, and academia, and of, co of course the inspectors general, numbers are important, and I won't denigrate that. But numbers are not necessarily the best or even one of the best metrics for how well we're doing in education. It is certainly an indicator, and it's certainly something that's considered. But if we were talking about education, numbers might be the number of schools or the number of teachers, number of students in school is an important one. If we're talking about health, it may be the number of health clinics in a province. For agriculture, a number that we might refer to is the yield of saffron in Wardak province or barley in Paktia or beets being raised and cultivated in Balkh province. But again, these are just one metric. <clears throat> Let me drill down in health for an example. If you do a Google search for mortality or life expectancy in Afghanistan, you'll come up with a variety of different numbers. 
The World Bank says it's 61 years of age is the average life expectancy in Afghanistan. UNICEF says it's 60.5. The World Health Organization, not being one to be too precise, says it's between 61 and 62. <clears throat> the U.S. Census puts it at 51 years old based on a, on a 2006 government survey. So there's a wide disparity of the numbers. You could average those numbers if you wish and come up with a particular central number. But while it's a bit of a cliche, the truth here really is in the details. What we have to do at USAID is drill down into how the different methodologies are produced. When we look at numbers for life expectancy, we want the most current, the most credible, and the most comprehensive data that we can find. For that, we chose something called the 2010, fairly recent, Afghan Mortality Survey. It was done specifically on mortality in Afghanistan. This met our standards, it met the World Health Organization standards, and it comes up with 64 years as the average age or life expectancy in Afghanistan. It's a small thing, small discrepancy from the others, but just know that when USAID talks about numbers, we have in most cases done a fair amount of academic research to make sure we're using the best numbers that we can find. But these numbers even still require context. The life expectancy in 2002, based on the best data they had, was 42 years. So that's about a 20-year or 50% increase in life expectancy. That's not trivial. That was done by the training of doctors, midwives, and basic health care services that were provided by the U.S. and by other donors during those intervening years. But we also want to focus more than on length of life. Length of life without quality of life could be actually quite miserable. Health care to ensure quality of life is important as well. We want to build an Afghan institution that can provide health care to their population so that Afghans don't just live longer, they live better. So let me take it and make it a little more personable. Fariba Hashimi is a midwife. She lived in a remote village in Bamiyan province, and she saw close friends of hers who were of uh, childbearing age suffer and even die in several cases from, the, from bearing children without any medical attention. So Fariba, on her own, went and became trained to be a midwife. That was about eight years ago, and she is now one of the most respected professionals in her village and, in fact, in her entire community. She was focused not just on longevity of life, but on quality of life. So with numbers, when we talk about economic growth, we might talk about the number of business associations founded or how many small and medium-sized businesses have, have been grown in a particular area. But I'll share the story of Esan Kahaber. He was an electrical engineer, which is my background, and he saved the United States government about $850,000 by identifying a particular malfunction at a particular power plant outside Kabul where his innovation was able to restart a particular piece of equipment that had been idle for over a year and a half. This was something that international consultants had not been able to do. This was something that had stymied the international community. And he, as well as the, uh, the Afghan utility DABs, take particular pride in the fact that it was an Afghan engineer who came up with a solution to this particular problem. When we talk about agriculture and we talk about numbers, we're talking about crop yields, food quality certifications, irrigation rates, hectares in production. But what about Mohammed Nasir? He has transformed his plot of land in the south of Afghanistan from a very shriveled, dusty lot that still had the tread marks of Soviet tanks across the mud into uh, vineyards, <clears throat> excuse me, where he raises grapes and raisins, among other things. He's able to reinvest the money into hiring family members and village cohorts and put them to work. So in summary, numbers make a point, but numbers are not the whole story. You need context, you need various sources, and most importantly, and increasingly, we are able to talk specifically to the Afghans themselves. Um, a, a third myth I'll address has to do with corruption. The, um, the image that I've seen in the Washington Post a number of times talks about bags of cash. I've been working in Afghanistan 12 years and I've never seen one. Um, and I don't actually think that it's a, I think it's a metaphor that they use for talking about the way programs are delivered. That isn't my experience at all working in Afghanistan. We have, uh, we have a very aggressive monitoring and evaluation program. And in the interest of time, I'm going to skim through it fairly quickly. But just to make the point that in each one of our programs, we don't just analyze the numbers. We actually talk to the people who are the intended recipients of the program. We can do that through crowdsourcing, using SMS technology over cell phones. Each of our partners are required in almost every case 
to have town meetings or to have open assemblies or shuras where the constituents of their program, whether it's a health clinic or a school, are able to come and, and uh, invent and, and discuss things that they don't like. Minutes of those meetings are taken. We talk about having tiers of reporting that are self-reporting, community reporting, government reporting, peer organization reporting, and then in addition to that in Afghanistan, we go an additional step and hire external monitors who go out um, on their own and will monitor whether or not we're getting what we expected from that program. A fourth myth, and one that I take uh, particular umbrage against, <clears throat> is that we're abandoning the women and girls of Afghanistan. This is just, uh, of all, the, the furthest from the truth among the different challenges. Regardless of which piece of the elephant you choose to consider in Afghanistan, our work with women and girls and the potential for women and girls is central to our work and it will be one of the last things that we would ever consider abandoning. So keep in mind where Afghanistan came from in 2002 and consider a few observations now. In 2002, Afghanistan was the most dangerous, one of the most dangerous places in the world in which to give birth. Today, maternal mortality has fallen by 80% in Afghanistan, and child death has dropped by more than half. The Afghan Women Judges Association has recently celebrated their third anniversary. Their aim is quite simple. They want to increase the number of women judges in Afghanistan. I find it remarkable that there are women courageous enough to be judges in Afghanistan. <clears throat> The American University of Afghanistan has launched a gender studies program. I come from the state of Georgia. I don't know when it was that we had a gender studies program, but it was probably not in the first 12 years of our existence. In, Af in AUAF student body across the board, 30% of their student body are Afghan women. And more broadly across the country, almost 40,000 young women are pursuing advanced degrees. Now, they may be technical services degrees or vocational training or university studies. Um, last year, the estimate was that about 40% of the voters who turned out for the election were women. Over 300 women ran for public office in Afghanistan, while thousands more worked as ballot counters and election monitors. Some people estimate up to 2,000 female journalists are actively reporting in Afghanistan. And women-owned businesses have gone from zero in 2002 to more than 3,000 nationwide. And USAID has supported that, providing over a thousand, I'm sorry, over a hundred thousand microfinance loans that total about $85 million. But let me just say this with respect to Afghan women. There is no more powerful advocate for the rights and dignity of women in Afghanistan than Afghan women. They are the ones who are attending classes, they're the ones who are graduated from high school and university, they're the ones becoming teachers, doctors, judges, lawyers, reporters, politicians, and businesswomen. What we're doing is just supporting them and continuing to give them the tools they need to advocate on their own behalf. The last thing I'll address is that nothing we've done in Afghanistan will last, the sustainability myth. <clears throat> I am not a long-term USAID professional. I came to this line of work from the military. One of the things that strikes me about the work USAID does around the world is how much they foster sustainability into every aspect of their work, and that's certainly true in Afghanistan. But again, the Afghanistan in which we're working today is very different than the Afghanistan in which we worked in 2002. And Afghanistan is different from almost any other theater in the world in which I've worked. So if you take a particular program and hold it up to the light of 2014, if you aren't aware that that program was designed in 2003, it may look odd and it may look not sustainable. But when considered in context of the time during which it was designed, most of these programs include significant consideration of appropriateness and sustainability. Now again, as Paul and one of the other panels discussed, there is a healthy tension sometimes between humanitarian need, support for the counterinsurgency strategy with the, the U.S. military was pursuing, and developmentally sound principles of engagement. The challenge for our mission director in Afghanistan and for the ambassador and for the country team is how do you merge those three sometimes competing schools of thought into programming that makes sense. And my mantra is sensible, sustainable, and developmentally sound. That's not always simple, but I'll give you one example of something where I think we are producing sustainable results. And it has to do with the electrification of Kandahar, actually. This DABS is the DABS is the Afghan equivalent of Duke Power Company, I guess. It is a state-owned enterprise that produces electricity or, or that manages the electricity of Afghanistan. 
It was not even formed until 2009. Uh, it was created as a parastatal at the time. The owners or the, the board of the DABs, the Power Authority, are uh, Minister of Water and Power and four other ministers in the Afghan government. And remember, Afghans have no particular understanding or experience with this kind of corporate enterprise, so this is all new to them. And in the first years, they were receiving over $100 million in subsidy from the government of Afghanistan and indirectly from the donors just to get the, their company up and running. But from 2009 till today, <coughs> excuse me, they have reduced their financial subsidies for, to the from the government to zero, and they've increased their revenue by 140% over five years to the point that now DABS is reinvesting their own revenues into things like smart meters, which allow them to make sure that when they provide electricity to a home or a community or a business, they're able to receive the revenues for that electricity. On my next trip out to Kabul in a few weeks, one of the things we'll be discussing is how prepared is DABS as the state power enterprise for the country of Afghanistan to take over pay, providing electricity to the city of Kandahar. I heard that being discussed as I joined the forum this morning. Um, this is not easy. I, I, I have no great confidence that DABS is ready to do this. But Mr. Samadhi, who's the CEO, believes that he is. He has said that in 21 communities around Afghanistan and in nine provinces of Afghanistan, he is currently providing electricity using diesel power generators and floating the cost of the electricity so that widows and orphans continue to have a very subsidized rate of electricity, but businesses and private enterprises pay a, pay a higher rate. Will that work in Kandahar? No one knows. And even Mr. Samadhi is, is smart enough as a businessman to admit that this is a challenge. No one likes to have their electricity price suddenly rise quite a bit. He expects there'll be political outcries, and the issue will be both a political question of does the government have the stomach to tolerate the political outcry, and does DABS have the ability to deliver? So in conclusion, my dad is a uh, red meat Republican from the great store of Georgia. He lives in Stone Mountain, Georgia, and whenever I go home, dad asks me, Pardon my language, what in the hell are we doing in Afghanistan after 15 years? Why are we still putting U.S. tax dollars into Afghanistan? And I like to tell people in Washington, if I can stand the scrutiny of my dad and answer his red meat Republican, uh, bring our money home now questions, I can stand the scrutiny of anyone. A, a, a point, a few points that I'll close with that I, that I always make to my dad. Afghanistan continues to be a very risky place to work, not just for Americans, but for Afghans as well. But it's one where brave Americans, both in uniform and as civilians, do continue to work for our national security interests. Remember, we're not there just to make Afghanistan better for Afghanistan. This is in our national interest, Dad. Despite imperfect and young government systems, challenging terrain, active combat, and sometimes incompetence on the part of the international community, the Afghanistan of today is far better than it was in 2001. Far better than it was in 2001 something about which Afghans can and should be proud and increasingly optimistic, and something we as Americans should be very proud of supporting. Afghanistan today is vastly different than it was in 2001, and the Afghans deserve most of the credit, but we should be proud of our part in supporting it. And finally, I'll encourage Dad to look deeper into the news stories beyond the all-sizzle, no-stake headlines, and maybe even visit some of the fantastic media that's being produced by Afghans on YouTube and on particular blogs, where Afghans now are able to speak in, in English, I might add, fairly coherently and fairly eloquently about the progress their country is making and equally importantly about the challenges they still face. Afghanistan has made extraordinary progress in a little over a decade, but still faces daunting challenges. Rebuilding sustainable communities in Afghanistan is important and will require patience, but it is certainly achievable. So I apologize, I went a little bit long. I'm happy to release you to lunch, but if you would like, I'm also happy to take a few questions from the audience. And I yield to the moderator for what your wishes are. Why don't we do a burning question? Yes, ma'am, I see the first hand over there. I'm a PhD student uh, here at UMass. Um, I had a couple of Quick questions. Uh, first, if you could describe how effective is your um, is your working relationship with the political governance in uh, Afghanistan, and is has that helped or hindered the work that you do there? And secondly, you talked quite a bit about um, 
how uh, uh, the media portrays Afghanistan in, in the United States. Do you think that outside of the turbulent history of modern Afghanistan, you know, most of the narrative is about the Taliban, the Soviets, or the US military intervention. Do you think that um, having more stories and changing their narrative to focus on you know, the, the richness and wealth of culture and civilization in Afghanistan before all the wars, do you think that would help you in your work in terms of getting money from the policymakers? And you mentioned that, you know, you used to be in the military. Are you, do you miss that DOD budget now that you work with the USAID? Um, your last question is absolutely. Um, there's a, used to be a bumper sticker that said, um, joy will be when um, teachers have all the money they need and the Air Force has to have a bake sale to buy a jet fighter. I mean, I, yes, a reallocation of resources to support development around the world would be brilliant. Your next to last question about perceptions of Afghanistan, I, I frequently tell people, if I could fly you into Afghanistan from Istanbul to mazar sharif as opposed to flying you through Kabul, you would never know in mazar sharif that you're in a war-torn country. mazar sharif and across the north and to the west of Afghanistan, all the way over to Herat, in mazar sharif they now have value chains where Afghan farmers are able to produce all different kinds of vegetables and fruits that are packaged and sold across the border as part of the exports that I believe Jim was referring to. In, in Herat, there are uh, marble quarries where Italian experts are quarrying Afghan marble and turning it into things that parallel or match the Italian uh, quality of marble artifacts. So there, there are stories on the periphery of what is the big story of Afghanistan. But I was thinking this morning, you know, if, if you were looking at the news coverage of the Republican primary, all they talk about is Donald Trump, much to the chagrin of other candidates, the 15 or 16 other candidates who are out there. So I'm a little bit in the position of one of the other candidates. We have a good story to tell, and there are elements of it that might even be newsworthy. But I do recognize how hard it is to sell a good news story about pomegranates in the south of Afghanistan. But that's the challenge for all of us in government, and, and I would even share the, the, the joy with the, the embassy of Afghanistan and others in this room. We need to find ways to get to the average American the story of the benefits that their tax dollars have brought, not just to Afghanistan, but to our own national security, so that they realize there has been a return on the investment. And we need to continue demonstrating that return on the investment. Then your first question is the most challenging. Local government in, in Afghanistan is a, um, is a very different beast depending on where you are. And in fact, the historical traditions of Pashtunwali and of uh, Shuras in one part of Afghanistan, they call them Jirgas in another part of Afghanistan, how the individual communities themselves govern themselves or have governed themselves for centuries is, is not something we're going to change particularly quickly. Um, there is another tension to talk about, which is modern jurisprudence and modern judicial reform with judges and lawyers and courts vice traditional systems of dispute resolution. And how do we determine which applies when? We will never attract the business that Jim Bullion was talking about to Afghanistan if the best we have to offer is a traditional two goats for your transgression kind of jurisprudence. We're going to have to have business law and commercial law that applies in Afghanistan if we're to bring outside investment in. However, we're not going to have success in my lifetime in some of these rural valleys of Afghanistan getting them to accept a Western, notice, a Western notion of two lawyers arguing before a judge who came from some other part of the country. So one of the things we're focusing on is finding ways to work with local governments and governance that recognizes and acknowledges the traditional nature of local governance in Afghanistan, but helps to ensure that it's within the, the Venn circle, if you would, of acceptable norms. They can no longer exclude women from local governance. That's not acceptable. They can no longer prevent girls from going to school. They have to begin to recognize the woman's right to divorce and the woman's right to property. These are not things we're going to do overnight. And these are things that I hear from particular communities of interest about almost every day who think that we're not making enough progress, we're not pushing hard enough on the rights of women, children, and some of the internally displaced persons and at-risk populations. So does it make it harder? No, but it is absolutely a part and parcel of almost all the work that we do because it is at the local level where most politics is actually played out. So I hope you enjoy your lunch and thank you very much again for having me to speak.